morning. Good morning. You all sounded good out there this morning. It was good to hear your voices. I'm sure the Lord is pleased with that. Man, we have a great band, don't we? They're amazing. Incredible, right? Golly, I don't know how we get them. <sighs> Must be our huge payroll. Hey, uh, before we jump into this morning's uh, lesson from God's Word, I know you're eagerly anticipating us opening God's Word, but before we do that, there's some, there's some pressing health concerns in and amongst our family, and so, we, and, and a couple other things too, but I want to I wanna just like lift up these people as one voice. Can we just do that this morning before we jump in, and then we'll, we'll dive into to God's Word. So if you could just uh, do me a favor, just kind of bow your heads before the Lord, it's a symbol to Him that that you're, you're uh, humble enough to say, hey, I can't fix these things, but we realize that you can. And so, uh, Lord, with that being said, we, uh, we just acknowledge you, and we uh, acknowledge now our weakness and frailty and our inability to, to do things uh, that we'd love to do. There are people in our life, Lord, that we love. You placed them in our life, and, and you stirred a great love up for them in our hearts. And so that's why we pray for them, Lord, because we love them. We want what's best for them, and believing that you want what's best for them also, we just want to come together in agreement, and our desire is that we're agreeing with your heart as well as we lift these things up to you. Lord, we lift up uh, Sarah Cooksey, who, uh, she's only been here a couple times, her husband Jonathan is here every week, but this week he's not, because uh, Sarah is at home, Lord, as you know, um, trying to find some healing in her eyes and she's uh, her sight is almost gone and she's got some issue with her contacts I don't know the details of it Lord but uh, I'm not an eye surgeon but you are an eye surgeon Amen. and so Lord we just pray for her we ask that you would bless her give her clear vision not only to see physically around us but Lord we would ask that you'd grant her clear vision to see you and to know you well and to worship you. Mm -hmm. I know that I am praying for her husband right now. He would want that for her as well. And so we agree with him and we agree with you that you desire that she knows and loves you and sees you for who you really are. Lord, we lift up our dear brother, Tom Simpson. Some of you will remember him, some of you do not. He was our associate pastor here for a short time. One of the most precious men I've ever met in my life. Lord, we pray for him as he is in the hospital with an infection on his, uh, his port for his dialysis, for his kidneys. And so, Lord, we, we see your hand upon him already. We know that you've been bringing healing back into his body. We're pleased with that. But, Lord, I'm asking you and we're asking you for a complete, absolute healing of this infection so that he can get back to being the amazing man of God that he is. Lord, just so encouraged by him that although he's on his hospital bed with a 104 temperature, that he would have it in his heart to call me and check on me. Like, he is awesome. And so I, I, I just love him, and I, I'm, we're, we're praying, Lord, that you would bring him to complete healing from this infection. Lord, we lift up our dear brother, Scott Bleagy, who's not been with us for so long because of his health conditions, his hip. His hips, his knees, his back, and now a tumor in his brain. And so, Lord, we are pleading with you. We are pleading with heaven right now, petitioning you, Father, that you would bring healing to his body. And I'm not talking about a little. I'm not talking about a drizzle. I'm talking about a downpour. Lord, I pray, I plead with you that you would heal him, make that tumor shrink and vanish before the doctor's eye. Bring healing to his body, Lord. Lord, we thank you for him and his great attitude through all of this. I would only hope that I could have the same attitude that he has if I was going through something like he was. So he's an inspiration to me and a, and a wonderful man, and, I, and we love him, and we ask for healing. Lord, we lift up Troy and Rebecca Gray as uh, Rebecca has lost her mom, uh, Miss Jean, who sat, if you guys want to look for a moment she sat right here almost every week before COVID came and um, she has passed away just the other day not from COVID just from other things she had a slew of issues but lived a long life in her mid to upper 80s and um, Lord we're just grateful that as she passes from this life 
into the next, that she is secure in your hands. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that she gave her life to you years and years ago, um, and that she's going to be able to spend eternity with you mm -hmm. in a place of bliss, paradise, wonderful, no sorrow, no tears, no pain, no sickness, no death, everything good. And we're glad that she's going to be there with you. And Lord, we want to be there with her and with you for all eternity. And so um, for those of us that have said yes to you, Lord, we rejoice in the fact that our future is so wonderful. We rejoice in the fact that Miss Jean's future is wonderful. And we would pray right now for all of us maybe that are in this room that might not feel so secure in that. That, that today would be the day that you would work in their heart and draw you so draw them so close to you that there's just no choice in their will left but to say yes Jesus yes I want you and to secure their place in heaven so we would lift that up to you in the name of Jesus amen amen, amen. amen. all right amen. loved ones well listen we've been studying through the book of Acts right hey Lori hey hey Miss Lori so we've been studying through the book of Acts, and you watch that little bumper video, and you're like, all right, so where in Acts are we this week? Well, yeah. we're probably not going to do that. We're going to throw a little curveball at you. But we've been studying the book of Acts, and we're being encouraged to do big things, right? We're, we're reading the book of Acts, the book of, uh, let's rename it for a second, because the name's not divine, right? The content is. The, the name, we call it the book of expectations, too. What God expects of people who encounter Jesus. And Jesus says, go be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Right? Go make disciples of all people. And so we see the people in the book of Acts, how they respond to the call of Jesus. And it's in there because all scriptures God breathed and teaches us to know the truth. Right? And where we're wrong. So it's a corrective. And so we're studying the book of Acts not to say, hey man, Peter and Paul were awesome. We're, we're studying the book of Acts so we can go, yeah, we're supposed to do what they did. But they're high expectations, right? We're supposed to do big things. We're supposed to move that kingdom forward, right? Give it all you got. <laughs> well, that's all fine and good, right? But my all ain't much. Some of us feel that way, right? And I understand that when you read the book of Acts and the preacher gets up to you and he puts up that high bar every week of, hey, this is what the Bible says you should be doing. And you're looking in the mirror going, I'm not doing anything like that. I'm bad. So, so I get all that, and I can understand that when, when, when people aren't pulling the trigger, it's because sometimes they think that the expectations are way too high. And sometimes we think that, not just that the expectations are too high, but, but, but my qualifications are so low, right? So there's two things that could happen when someone says, hey, you're supposed to do this. We find ourselves not doing it, we don't pull the trigger because I can't do all that because it's so big and hard and monumental, right? And sometimes we feel like, not so much that it's so big, but that I'm so insignificant. What could I possibly do to, to create some change in this world, to advance the kingdom of God, to fight for the souls of men and women? Woo! Right? That's awesome. <laughs> but sometimes we just can't move forward because we feel like we can't do it. And so, this past Monday night when I was here at for prayer and wait a minute, most of you guys weren't here for that. <laughs> Just saying. Hey, we didn't know about it. Oh, oh okay. Two people up there. <laughs> I will say that you said you're going to be here today, and you were. I like the person of your word. <laughs> Thank you, for real. But I was here back last Monday night, and and we were having prayer, and while I was praying, you know. It's kind of weird, like God actually talks to people still. Did you know that? Did you know that? Right? So I was in prayer, and when I was in prayer, I, I feel like the Lord started to download into me some things, some encouragement for you. So he encouraged me with some things that I'm supposed to teach you, right? That's the Great Commission, isn't it? Go teach them all that I teach you, right? That's what we're supposed to do. So... We're not going to study the book of Acts. We're going to take a little turn. And I want to spend a little time this morning talking about you engaging in book of Acts stuff and maybe why you don't and some encouragement so that maybe you can, right? Because you want to. You're hearing these messages week after week. You're like, I want to engage. I want to engage, but I haven't yet. Well, I want to talk about the average everyday American. That's what we are. I don't know about the church in uh, Iceland. But I can talk about the church here. We're 
Americans, right? And, and, and we're Christians. 70% of us say that we're Christians, right? But very little kingdom work is being done. So let's just talk about us, right? We're all, anyone here graduate from Harvard Medical School? Liar, you're supposed to be going to seminary. What is wrong with you? <laughs> so, so it, the lack of air conditioning has fried his brain. So, but we're all regular folks, right? Our, our, our congregation are Home Depot people, right? Just, just regular blue collar people. Let's, so let's talk a little bit about regular, everyday American Christians across the board, just regular folks like you and I, and, and let's find some fresh hope to, to engage in some of these things that we've been learning for the last, oh, four to six months studying through the book of Acts. So let's, let's, just, let's just talk about this. Fresh stew, man, I like it. Look at that. High and tight, baby, high and tight. Bald is beautiful. So, 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 <laughs> woo, bookends over here. Hey, over here. hey, 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 all right, all right. All right, so listen, did you know that the average uh, American doesn't have a college degree, only 35%, so let's just call it a third, right? A third of the citizens, adult citizens in this country have a bachelor's degree. So nothing wrong with a vocation, nothing wrong with going to technical school, you could be a plumber, you could be an electrician, those are awesome things. But I'm just talking about like the super intellects, like there's not a whole lot of us, like none of us are like really rock and smart, like 35%. Third. That means two thirds of the population do not have a college degree. Okay, so not like overwhelmingly intelligent. No offense, I'm in that group. The average American doesn't have Trump money with their plane with their name on it. Right? No one's leaving this church today, going out on the parking lot and getting into their private helicopter that says "rich." right or Colby it's not saying that on there right we're gonna get into our junky old Hyundai's and Toyota's in my case Subaru's and we're gonna hope that the car gets us home Amen. the average person in America is not rocking the the Trump money okay we're making 34 grand a year we're making 34 grand a year the the poverty line for a family of four is 36,000 so I'm well aware of of, of, of my poverty as I'm making $24,000 a year. So I understand that I'm not some very wealthy individual, okay? None of us are really killing it, if you will. Nearly one, this is, this is interesting, I found this thing out. Nearly one in every hundred Americans will find themselves behind bars at some point in their life. And I don't mean at the bar. That's like most of us. I'm talking about behind bars. At some point in our life, one out of every hundred will find themselves in jail for one reason or another. That's staggering to me. I, I, I couldn't believe that. How about this one? Nearly 50% of marriages, inside and outside of the church, end up in divorce. And, and listen, if you, if you ever are so fortunate to try again, the number gets worse. And if you try again, the number gets worse. And if you try, every time it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. So tons of divorce, okay? So you see just all these things that are kind of going against us, the average everyday person. How about this one? Right now in America, there are 11.4 million single moms. Okay, and that's not because dad passed away. The vast majority of it is because deadbeat loser fathers never show up at all. Or they show up for a moment or two and then they bolt for a better opportunity or they're afraid because men are boys, okay? And so what happens is think, think about this, this single mom who would come to church and here, here's the preacher saying, do great things for the kingdom, do th great things for the kingdom. And she's working two or three jobs just trying to put dinner on the table for the kids. How am I going to do great things for the kingdom? I don't have a, a minute to spare, right? How's she going to do anything? And then what about the kids that are left there? They have no dad to discipline them. No, 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 a son who doesn't have a father to look at to say, I want to be like that guy. 
Or a daughter that looks at her dad and finds the love of a father and says, hey, I want to marry a guy like that, right? Where's that? So it's really difficult for them to feel like, hey, I can do great things for the Lord because they feel like they're behind the eight ball right from the giddy up, right? And then when it's all said and done, how about just the fact that we feel very insignificant because we're only, what, one person out of seven billion and we're supposed to advance the kingdom to all those people. So you look at it like, man, that's so significant, so massive. And I am only one. I am so insignificant. I don't have any time. I'm not qualified. I've done too much. I have a record. I'm shy. I'm scared. I'm stupid, right? So what we say to ourselves, reason after reason after reason, and then you come to church and the preacher keeps yelling at you to advance the kingdom of God, change the world. And meanwhile, I'm just trying to make rent. <laughs> Sound familiar? I know that a lot of people have felt that way over the years coming to this church. Because I preach the high bar of scripture and a lot of us are feeling, bro, I can't even make my car payment. And you're passing a bucket? You're asking me to give more time to come and pray when I got 17 kids. I'm trying to round up these cats to get them to, to bed at night before school so I can rest for 13 minutes before the alarm clock goes off. A lot of us feel that way, right? The task is massive and I'm so insignificant. That's the way most people are. And that's why a lot of people are not doing a whole lot for the kingdom of God. That's why a lot of a lot of pressure is put on preachers and elders and deacons and the overseers of the church, the small group leaders. They are the ones who are doing stuff. And the, the, the most, most of us aren't doing much of anything except maybe coming to church to listen to them. You don't know why I think about this. You don't want to know why. And hear me out on this totally before you boo me. Do you want to know why people come to church? I'm like, really why they come to church? They come to church because they want to hear some advice from a guy that seems to have it all together because they don't. Some people come to church to hear from a guy who seems to have it all together because they need some hope just to get through today, right? But let me tell you something. Transparency. I don't have it all together <coughs> at all. Amen? <laughs> and my wife says, amen. 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 Right? No one has it all together at all. But let me tell you something. Look at me now. God can build his kingdom through you. That's right. He can build his kingdom through you with all of your mess and all of your failure and all of your flaw and all of your I have nothing to offer crap. He can build his kingdom through you. He wants to. He can. But we as people, we create standards for God. Not what he has to live up to, but we create the standards and impose them on him and say, these are the standards you have for me. Before I can do anything, I have to be this or I have to do that, right? We create standards for God. Because of this, and because of this, and because of that, I can't, right? These are all just walls you have erected. These are just limits that you put up. These are, but they're false. They're facades. They're not real, right? You push on them, they'll fall right over. These are false standards and false expectations. Let me encourage you this way. 1 Samuel 16, 7 would inform us this way. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. Amen. Right? Amen. The Lord, yeah. everyone should be saying amen there. Amen. We keep telling God what to do and none of it ever happens. We're like, what's going on here, man? Because he doesn't see things the way you do. I saved the more famous one for after. The first one he doesn't see, that's from 1 Samuel. And half of you going, there's a book called 1 Samuel in the Bible? But the one we all know is from Isaiah, right? His ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts, says the Lord, right? Even as the heavens are above the earth. How far is that? Here's the earth. How far do the heavens go? Forever, right? Forever, right? I don't know where it goes, but it's really far. And even as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways and thoughts above yours. You don't see things the way I see things. And so God's heroes through history aren't some short list of rich, powerful, good-looking, high-educated, mighty men. 
No, God's heroes are unseen, unsung, unlikely, unknown, unpopular, unprepared, and unqualified. Right? And I'm wondering if maybe there's some people in this room here this morning that are one of God's unheroes. Maybe that's you. Maybe you've just been waiting for this day to come so God would release you to do some things for him that you've never done before. For us to do this, we have to ask the Lord to help us because we're stubborn people. Raise your hand if you're stubborn. <laughs> now put your hand down and bow your head so we can pray. <laughs> God, we definitely need your help now. Your word tells us that faith comes from hearing the word of God. Lord, none of the, the, the superheroes in your, in, your, in your word were incredible people from what we would see. But they were incredible to you. The thing that made them incredible, the thing that put them into Hebrews chapter 11, was that they had great faith. They trusted you. They didn't trust themselves. There was nothing in the mirror to look at and say, I can trust that. But they can look at you and say, I can trust you. Lord, we need that. We need you to work on us right now. We need you to bust down those stupid facades that we have put, or put up, erected in front of us that keep us from doing the things you've called us to do. The ch your church in this community and beyond is hurting because of us and others in other churches that are in these self-imposed prisons of excuse and reason and limit and standard. And all the while, you don't see us the way we do. You see it totally different. And so, Lord, I pray that today you'd give us eyes to see ourselves the way you see us. Spirit of God, control, work, lead, teach, convict. Whatever we need, Lord, be that God to us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you ready? You ready to study about God's unheroes? Are you? Are you? Anyone? This is the part. Okay, I don't get paid much. I just told you what I got paid, right? Pay me with an amen. Amen. Are you guys ready? So I need some interaction here, guys. Okay? I needed some interaction. So you ready? Let's start with this guy right here. Show him, Nick. After this day, you shall see his chariots no more. No! start with Moses, okay? Not Charlton Aston. Let's start with Moses, okay? So before we talk about him as a person, let's talk about his accomplishments, like what God did in his life, just to see if he's worthy of our examination, okay? So you can kind of see that right there on the film. That kind of, that was a big deal. Um, God was going to release his people from the nation of, of Egypt, hundreds of years of bondage, uh, they say there was about, you know, theologians, none of us were there back then, give or take two million people or so, right? And so he's going to lead them out of Egypt. And so uh, to do that, God performs some really incredible miracles that are known as the Ten Plagues. And he does it through Moses, right? He gives Moses the, the, the orders, and Moses says some things, and boom, the, 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 the Ten Plagues come, okay? And so he did that. Then, of course, he opens the Red Sea. That's pretty amazing. Uh, he confronts Pharaoh, the, the most powerful man on the earth at the time, and, and not a guy like, like we have some powerful people. Like our president's a, you know, a powerful man, right? But he can't just say, uh, execute that guy. doesn't work that way, right? Some nations have that. 
But that was like that in, in Egypt. Like if, if you, you didn't like Pharaoh, like there's one part of the movie, I don't know if it's it, uh, how accurate it is completely, uh, or if the Pharaoh looked like Yul Brenner, but he says, the day you come before me is the day you die, Moses. Right, that's what he says, like that could happen. You tick this guy off who thought he was a god and the people worship him as a god, he'd kill you and Moses is used to confront the most powerful person in the world. There was a thing called the tabernacle that, that the people of Israel, that they would uh, use. It was like this thing here, but it was a temporary structure, like a tent, if you will, but very elaborate. And, and God downloaded the blueprint for the tabernacle where, where into Moses. It's where the Ark of the Covenant was, right? Where, where, where there was gold angel wings, like, like let's say this box up here on the top, and above and between the, the angel wings, the manifest presence of God was there. Like, he's everywhere, but highly concentrated, if you will, right there, right? If you go in wrong, you die. That, that's, and God used Moses to download those blueprints into him. He leads, uh, is he a good leader? Well, he leads uh, approximately 2 million people out of Egypt. And it says that, that not only did, 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 did the Jewish people leave, but a lot of the Egyptians that were there, that were overwhelmed with what they were seeing being done through Moses, were so overwhelmed, they were like, yeah, I'm going with these guys when they leave. So some people from Egypt actually left their own nation and went with him. A Jewish scholarship from way back even to the present say that Moses wrote the, five, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, except for the last eight verses of Deuteronomy, which... It's believed that Joshua wrote those, okay? So that's just a short list of some of the things that God had done through Moses. But can we all just agree that, that God used Moses in a very, very powerful way? Amen. That he used Moses in a, not just a powerful way, but a, but a, 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 a generational powerful way. Like we're, it's 2020, we're still talking about this dude that lived 3,400 years ago, right? And we're talking about him right now, and his life is going to teach us. So he's used him in an amazing way. But let's take a, let's take a moment to look in the rearview mirror, if you will. Let, let's take a look back at Moses before his successes that we just listed to you, right? Before the Red Sea, before the Ten Commandments up on Mount Sinai, right? Before any of that happened, let's take a look at Moses. So if you're in the book of Exodus, and you can if you want to, the book of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 2, it starts out by saying that a man and woman were married and had a kid. So insignificant they are that they're not even named in this text. Just two slaves, which means they would be poor, Which means they were uneducated. Yep. And they had this baby. And they didn't have like gender reveal party <laughs> and a baby shower. And they didn't have some dad sticking his chest out and going, that hey, son, he comes from a good line, you know? They're not doing that at all. Because just before we read about the parents, we find out that the Pharaoh has made a decree across his country in fear that Israel's growing too strong. If they have some mighty men of God grow up, right? He, he, might, he, might, try to, he might try to conquer me, right? He might round up the troops and mighty men. They don't want men, right? The girls can live. But the men that are born, they're to be drowned in the Nile River. Kill them all. So no, no big... No, no dad running around passing out cigars to everybody. Hey, my kid was born, my kid. No, they're not doing that at all, right? Because they don't want the kid to die. So what they do is they take the kid and they put him in a basket. It's kind of sick, really. They put him in a basket and they put him in the Nile River. A little research will tell you that the Nile River has quite a decent crocodile residence. And they put the kid in the river in hopes that someone will find him that will take care of him so he won't die. And God is in all of this, and so he finds the right people, and he ends up growing up in the palace 
with the Pharaoh right. as Pharaoh's stepkid. Yeah. Awesome. But here's the thing. I want, you to, I want you to think about this. Like That's awesome, right? It's awesome, awesome, awesome. But I want you to think for a second, and maybe some of you are limited in what you do because you're limited about what you think about yourself. Think about Moses for a second. Yeah, it ended up being awesome. He's in the palace, rich, opulent, anything you want, right? But how about the fact that his parents gave him away? How, how does a kid grow up knowing my, my parents didn't want me? Like That's not a good feeling, right? And I know there's people that are like that. Given up for adoption, given away. Well, we didn't want something to happen to you. Don't you love me? Why would you do that? It says that, it says that when he was done nursing and he went to solid food, when's that, moms? Six months? Something, something like that. They, don't, they have Similac back then, you know? You know, you breast bread and you're dead. So what is it, six months to a year? That's when they named him. Read it. They named him after he stopped breastfeeding. Six months to a year goes by before he even has a name. How insignificant. My parents gave me away. The king wanted to kill me. They stuck me in a river, and I have no name. Not a really good start to this guy's life. Would you say? Well, he grows up, and in Exodus chapter 2, you're going to see that Moses actually kills a guy. He sees an Egyptian soldier being cruel to this Israeli slave, and Moses thinks nobody's looking, and he kills the dude and buries him in the sand. Jewish mafia. Right? That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. Jewish mafia, right? Yeah. Moses could have grown up and bought a Casino in Vegas, I guess. He buries the guy, so now he's a murderer. Now, I understand that the guy was doing wrong. I understand maybe the guy deserved it. But I've never killed the dude. Maybe you have. But I'd imagine even if you kill someone that was being rotten, there has to be some level of shame and guilt that comes along with ending someone's life. I don't know. I'd imagine it would be pretty tough. So he's a murderer. He's got a horrible childhood, given up for adoption, threatened to be killed, unnamed, uneducated people that brought him into this world of slaves. And then he runs away. And he becomes a fugitive on the run to add that to his record. In Exodus 2.15, it says that Pharaoh found out what Moses had done and tried to see justice and have Moses killed. And so Moses flees to Midian. Can you bring up the map? Dunhammer. All right. So there's, there's a map of the Middle East. You can see it all over here, okay? So Midian, I don't know if you can see it, but here's, here's Israel. Can't really reach it. Here's Israel right here. And here's Jordan now. Here's Saudi Arabia right here. And here's Egypt. Okay, so here's where Moses was in Egypt. And he killed a guy. And in fear for his life, he runs away through the Sinai Desert into northern, what we know, now know as Saudi Arabia, which was then Midian. He runs away to here. Midian is full, it's all desert. But I found something out this week that's pretty cool. It actually snows there. So yeah, it actually snows there. A couple times a year you'll see snow fall, and usually it's pretty substantial. So it's a really awful climate, a real terrible, you can kill that. It's a real terrible environment, and Moses runs away from there with a record at age 40. So at age 40, it says, we find that out in Acts 7, 23, that at age 40, he runs away from Egypt with a, a, a felony record, and he's now a fugitive on the run, and he's out there in the desert for 40 years just living the simple blue-collar life of a fugitive felon 
shepherd. That's who Moses is. And so now, at 80 years old, like he's old, right? He's old. I don't care who you are. 80 is up there, man, right? 80 is up there. And so he's an old person. Maybe, maybe you're, you can relate with that. Maybe you're close to 80, just shy of 80, maybe approaching 80. But here's Moses at 80 years old, thinking probably like we, most of us think with our aches and pains, that our best years are behind us. And so maybe I'm just going to, you know, move to Florida. <laughs> maybe do a little fishing, right? Amen. Do a little fishing. My neighbor across the street, nice fellow, I think his name is Aaron. Moses and Aaron, how about that? <laughs> Went over to his house the other day with my wife, and he opens up the garage. He's talking about how he's retired now, right? And you open his garage, and what's his garage filled with? You got a whole section with golf clubs and golf balls. And then over here, it's all fishing stuff. Maybe that's what Moses should do. Maybe he should just move to Florida and just kind of, you know, take it easy now. That's what our country tells us we should do, right? Give it your best from like 20 to 60 or so, and then retire and slow down and take it easy. World changing, you might think, is a young man's game, right? Changing the world is for the young person. Well, let me encourage you. I want to read a section of scripture to you. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse, uh, started, I think it's in verse 12. So here's Peter, right? And he's starting to get a little bit older now, too. And so I want this, I want to encourage our generally an older population in this area, not just those in the room, but those who are watching as well. A lot of the people in this area are a little bit older, but yet the book of Acts still stands. The expectations of God still stand, but we're, we're struggling with trying to get going because, you know what? Look, I'm on a walker. He's not. It's, it's their job. That, that's the mentality of a lot of people. And we've been taught in America that you work real hard, then you get put out to pasture when you retire, to just relax, just don't be a burden. But you're not really going to do a lot of stuff now for the kingdom of God. You're not going to advance the kingdom to the ends of the earth, right? You're not going to be involved with the epic battle of, of, of saving souls for King Jesus against the dark, dark forces of the enemy and the underworld and all that, right? Woo! You're not doing that. You're a little bit older, so... Here's what Peter says in verse 12. Peter's preaching the gospel. He says, therefore, I will always remind you about these things. He's preaching the gospel to him prior to that. You can read it. But he says, I'm always going to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you have been taught. It is, it is only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live. For our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. Right? Moses, 80, older. It's, it's, you wake up in the morning and you feel worse today than you did yesterday. I get it. I do too. And so Peter's like, listen, the Lord has shown me I'm not going to be around forever. I'm going to soon leave this life. Watch this. So, so I'm going to move to the villages. <laughs> I'm going to move to the ocean and get a little spot out there and just scallop all day. No. He says, the Lord Jesus has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life, so I will work hard to make sure you always remember these things after I am gone. Amen. See, that's, that's what the older folks are supposed to do. right? They don't slow down. They speed up. Why? Not because they have more energy, but because they have less time. Urgency should, should be the word here. Step in. Get after it because you're going to be dead soon. That's just the, I mean, that's what it says, right? I'm not making anything up. We speak truth in this church. You're going to die soon. Get after it, right? You got to get after it, right? People need to hear what you're going to say. Listen, older folks, you know a lot. You, you've been through a lot, right? You've worked your whole life. You've raised kids. You've been married. You've owned companies. You've closed companies. You've been married. You've been divorced. You've been widowed. You know stuff. You're an encourager. You're, we need you to get involved, right? Don't take what you've got and bring it to the grave. Share it with someone before they go through what you went through without your advice. No. Speak up. Speak up. Okay? So listen. The, t the culture will teach you, you know, I'm one in seven billion. I don't have much to offer. I'm just a number. 
I'm not qualified, I'm not educated, I don't have enough, I don't have the platform, I don't have, I don't have enough likes on Facebook to get the word out. But there's two words that wreck all that. But God. Amen. But God. See, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, it says that Moses is just out doing his usual shepherding thing, right? And he's 80 years old with a felony record as a fugitive, poor, given away for, for adoption. Like, he's a nobody. He's a nobody. If he was anything in this world, he was something when he was a young man as a prince of Egypt, and he gave it all away. He walked away from all that. So any platform he had is gone, any power he had is gone, any prestige he had is gone. He is nothing but a felony fugitive who's working as a shepherd. That's like the, that's the low of the lows, working in Midian in this horrible climate for 40 years a no one. And God shows up and says, Moses, from a burning bush. What? From a burning bush? Who would have thunk? Who would ever make that? In a million years, you couldn't think of that one. Right? It says that the, an angel of the Lord, a messenger of the Lord, comes and speaks out of a bush. What, out of a pen? Who would think, why would God use a bush? If he shows up an angel of the Lord, you know, like tall, glowing wings, right? Shows up in a human looking form, but glowing with a face of lightning and sparkles. And like we've seen in other parts of the Bible, that would like make you check your depends, but at least you'd understand what it was, right? But instead, what does he do? He shows up in a bush. <laughs> Who would ever think of that? Why does God use a bush? Don't look at me like I got it all together. I'm literally asking you. I don't know. The same reason why he would use this know-nothing, felon, fugitive, adopted, zero loser guy to, to speak to the most powerful person in the world and use him to release his people from bondage. That's why. Because he doesn't see things the way you do. Because his thoughts and his ways are higher than your ways. Amen. That's why he used a bush Amen. to speak to Moses. That's why. And we got to grab hold of this, right? We have to understand that our ways of thinking aren't valid. Do you understand that you're wrong about everything? Yeah. There's the good news. There's only one who's right about everything. Amen. And it's our obligation as creation to give in to the creator. And if he says or does, then that's the truth. It doesn't matter what you think or feel. Okay? And so we assume that, we, that God should do things a certain way and that God should use certain tools to do certain things, but his ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. So at 80 years old, right? Who's within 10 years of 80, before or after 80? Raise your hand. Okay? Seriously. Okay. Awesome, right? Yeah, awesome. So at 80 years old, God calls Moses to be the man, right? He calls Moses at 80 to start his ministry. Not, not jump back in the game. You told me the other day, you stood it now. No, I'm not talking about that. That would be great. I'm talking about someone who's never done anything for the Lord. And he, and he calls him to start his ministry at 80 years old. That's what God does through a burning bush. What an unlikely choice, right? What an unlikely time. But that's when God does it. Not some highly educated Jewish business leader. Not some mighty, chiseled, rock-solid, proven warrior, gladiator, general who round up the troops. No, just an old, felon, fugitive shepherd. Not a likely choice at all. We wouldn't choose him. And you know what? Moses wouldn't have chosen him either. Moses didn't agree to this. 
That's not what I want. Do, do me a favor and, and look in Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. Look what it says. He's going to send him, and Moses protests to God. Just advice, just like, don't do that. Verse 11. But Moses protested to God. Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? So in those two little sentences, Moses summarizes everything I've just said to you for the last 30 minutes. He's like, who am I? Not only uh, is the Pharaoh huge, and I'm insignificant, but the people are large, and I'm one. Who am I? I'm not qualified for this. I'm the unlikely guy. You wouldn't want me. I'm not prepared. I'm not qualified. I'm not educated. I'm not powerful. I don't have a platform. Choose someone else. I'm not qualified. And then also, in Exodus 4, just one chapter, 4.10, should have kept my place. Exodus 4.10, another, another excuse comes. He says, Moses pleaded, pleaded with the Lord. Oh, Lord, I'm not very good with words. We've all heard this one before about Moses, right? He stutters or whatever. Moses pleads with the Lord. Oh, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled, right? This is what Moses thinks of himself. This is how Moses sees himself. I'm not qualified. I'm not an articulate speaker. I'm unable. I'm incapable. Who am I to do this? I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it. I'm not a good orator. I'm not eloquent. I can't do it. Every excuse in the book. But let me tell you something. I found something very, very interesting in my studies in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 7. And you can go there if you want. It's helpful always to put your eyes on God's word so you don't just think I'm making anything up. But as you're turning there, I want to tell you that Stephen, one of the, he's the first martyr for the church, right? He's the guy who, gets, who, who preaches Jesus, and he gets stoned to death as a result of that. Well, just before he preaches Jesus and gets stoned to death, it says in the previous chapter that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, Stephen is filled with the Holy Spirit. So much so that in Acts 6.15, it says that his face was shining bright like Jesus's. When, when Jesus was up on the Mount of Transfiguration, remember when he was glowing? Like he had the Spirit of God all over him, right? He was so filled with the Spirit, he was glowing. And it says that Stephen's face was doing the same thing, right? That's Stephen. And so with God's Spirit just exploding out of this guy in that very moment, he opens up his mouth and he begins to speak and he, and he gives the whole crowd this history of the people of, of Israel so to, to prove his credibility and his wisdom so they can understand that what he's saying is true and right. And part of that speech, he says in Acts 17, 22, he says this, Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians and he was powerful in both speech and action. Do you, okay, do you see the difference between what Moses thinks of himself, I can't speak, and what God thinks about Moses? See, God is speaking through Stephen. Stephen's not talking about himself. He's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit now. He's filled with the Spirit so much that he's glowing. And he says, because God directs him to say this, that Moses was powerful in speech. God's, and Moses is like, I can't speak. And God's like, oh, yes, you can. Because I don't see things the way you see things, right? You want to know why? You want to know why he's a powerful speaker? Because when God gives you the words, it's powerful. That's why. Amen. Because powerful words don't mean that they sound good. Does, listen, powerful words don't mean how they sound Powerful words mean what they cause. You get that? It's not, what, not how they sound. It's not how articulately expressed or how eloquent I am as a speaker. Powerful means when I say something, something happens, right? 
When Moses got up and spoke his word, he may have been fumbling all over his face. But when he spoke, stuff happened, right? That's powerful. So he's like, I can't say anything. God's like, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Powerful words don't always sound good. See, when you and I and Moses say, who am I? I can't do it. I'm overwhelmed. I, I'm not smart. I can't do it. I don't know what to say or how to say it. You know what God says about that? You're right. Yeah. You're right. You're not capable. You're not qualified. You're not prepared. But both times that Moses complains about not being prepared, not being the one who should do it, what does God answer? God answers this way. Exodus 3, 12. 3, 11 says, I can't. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And what, you know what Exodus 3, 12 says? You can. You know why? Because I will be with you. Because I will be with you. How many people have bent the knee to Jesus Christ in this room right now? Let me show you. Show your hands. You're Christian, right? You're Christian? Okay. God is with you. Amen. God is with you. Amen. He said when you believed, he gave you his Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. He's with you. He's yeah. as close as he will ever be yeah. right now, right? So he is with you. So can you go? Can you do? Resounding yes. Come on. Yeah. Sure, church. Yeah. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. And verse uh, chapter 4, verse 11 Verse 10 says, hey, I can't speak. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I can't say it, right? I fumbled my words. And God says, listen, go, for I will be with you, and I will give you the words to say, right? Amen. I will give you the words to say. Now, listen, that doesn't just happen in the Old Testament. This is why I love this, right? One, look, one book. If I, if, I, if I was in charge, which I'm not, I'd get rid of that old, old Testament, New Testament thing. You know why? One word. One book. Right? One faith, one baptism, one spirit, one God. One Bible, right? It's one big story of one big awesome God. Amen. And so Jesus Christ, well, it says Mark, Mark 12. you got to see this. It's so cool. Go to Mark 12. I don't usually jump all over the place because I'm, I'm not a topical guy, but here we are. Can't say no. I have to do it. Woe to me if I don't preach, right? So, so I'm sorry. It's Mark 13, not Mark. Did I say Mark 12? Yeah. yeah, Mark 13. Mark 13. Jesus is speaking in red. Watch this. Verse 10. The good news must first be preached to all nations, right? Be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. That's what he's called us to do. Now watch this. Just in case you're like Moses. I can't. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it. I'm not a good speaker. Verse 11. Jesus, out of Jesus' mouth. But when you are arrested... And stand trial. Don't worry in advance about what to say. Just say what God tells you at that time. For it is not you who will be speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come on. Yeah. Right? Amen. Absolutely. So, so listen. Most eloquent speaker? Maybe not. Most powerful speaker? Absolutely. Right? Because if God's speaking through you, it causes things to happen. That's powerful. Right? You might, be, uh, you might be stuttering, you might get tongue-tied, it doesn't make any difference. When the Holy Spirit is in you and he's telling you what to say, and you go and you're obedient, you open up your mouth, things are going to happen, right? It doesn't matter if you're 80 years old. Moses was 80 years old. He said, let my people go, and they left. He said, Red Sea, open. You saw it, right? It opened. Because God gave him the words to say. So when it comes to being God's man or woman... We see, we think and feel that there are requirements and standards and abilities that we need to be a world changer. And since we think we don't have those qualifications, we're like, yeah, God can't use me. Right? I've been divorced. I was a drunk. I sold drugs. I abused drugs. And booze. I porn binged. I sold porn. I watched porn. I've lied, I've cheated, I've stolen, I've cussed, I've been in the back of a police car. And my name is Moses and I'm your pastor, that's me. That's my description. But when I got saved, God didn't come to me with a long list of my failures and say, shame on you. He said, I forgive you. Now go tell people about me and use that book. Amen. 
That's what he said. He didn't shun me. When I got saved, I had tons of unanswered questions. As I do now, I've been studying now for a long time, and I've got, gone to seminary and all that stuff, so I've learned some stuff. But I still have so many unknowns, right? So many questions. Every time I read, like, but what about this and what about that? I still have so many unanswered questions. But, but back then, when I got saved, I had tons of unanswered questions. And I had tons of failure and flaw and mistakes. And I didn't have some degree from a Bible college. And I had all my sin and all my past and all my insecurities, just like the Moses of old. But God said, go tell people. Amen. And that's it. And so because I was just able to trust him enough to do that, and I trusted him enough to do what he said for me to do to start a work for him, I started to tell people about him, and I used this book. And because of that, there's been over 250 people that have given their life to Christ and gone under the waters of baptism through this church. And all that, I'm not taking credit for everything this church has done, but none of it would have happened unless some knucklehead, me, you, you, all of us, don't realize God can use you. And just say yes and show up for work, sir. And because of me saying yes, even though I was completely unprepared and unqualified, man, I got the, I, I started ministry because my pastor, six months after I got saved, handed me the keys to a 200 person church and said, I'm leaving, you're in charge. <laughs> I, my, my, I was still wet from the tank. And he hands me 200 people and says, here you go. You talk about unprepared. I mean, Moses was worth, he had 2 million. I had 200 and I was overwhelmed. But that's how I started. Listen, at 80 years old, he called Moses, completely unqualified. He was a felon, man. He was a fugitive. He was a shepherd. He was, he was uneducated in the ways of the Jews. And God called him to be one of the greatest leaders for the Lord in the history of the earth. Amen. And maybe, maybe one of you guys are one of God's unheroes here this morning. God chooses, as we're just we're, we're done. God chooses the unlikely, the unprepared, the unqualified, right? When you get saved, he gives you his mind. He gives you his spirit. He offers you, gives you his word so you understand things. And he gives you his promise to be with you and to give you the words to say. Might you be one of God's unheroes sitting here right now? You might feel like Moses did in the desert as the bush is speaking to him. Who am I? Who am I to, to, do, to do this great work for you? Haven't you seen what I've done? Can't you see who I am? Can't you see my bank account? Can't you see my education? Can't you see my record? Don't, don't you know I spent time in jail? Don't you know I, I've been divorced and, 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 and I failed and I did this and, I did, and, and, and all the list goes on and God would just say, tell people about me. Tell them what I'm doing for you right here, right now. Maybe you're one of God's unheroes. Let's pray. Father, I'm... Um, I'm grateful that, like super grateful, that you use the unlikely, the unsung, the unseen, the unpopular, the uneducated, the unqualified, the unprepared. I'm glad that you do that, Lord, because if it was not for that, you wouldn't use me. I thank you, Lord, that you choose people like me because I needed meaning. I needed purpose. I needed more when I wake up in the morning than to just make a paycheck. 
I needed some purpose in my life. And when Jesus, when you said you came that we might have life in abundance, what's more abundant, what's more awesome than living a kingdom advancing life? To sign up for your army, to, to battle darkness for the souls of men and women across the world, to advance the kingdom of Christ to the ends of the earth. Lord, when I think of what you've done for me, it motivates me beyond what I see. It motivates me to do what you've called me to do because I know your great love for me. And in response to my great love for you, I, I just say again, yes. Yes, send me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Leverage my life for your glory. And I wonder, Lord, who else you're speaking to here in this place today. I wonder who feels unqualified and unprepared to respond in a Book of Acts-like way. To completely devote myself to your purposes, to your kingdom, to advancing your name to the nations. Who are you speaking to? Who's your unhero in this room this morning? take a moment before we go into our offering and just ask those questions of the Lord. Put your excuses at the cross. Lay them down and leave them there. Because however you see yourself, God doesn't see you the same way that you do. He has a totally different mindset. And I want to encourage you. He loves to use what the world perceives as a loser. Because the worse off you are, the more glory goes to him. Hallelujah. Because losers and scum and failures and sinners and criminals, crooks, creeps, everything else, anything you want to call yourself or anyone else, they're not qualified to do great and good things mm -hmm. for a good God. And it's only... God inspiring them to do great things that it could happen. And so all glory goes to the Lord. When a dumb person, and I'm one, does something of value, it can't be credited to my account. It's credited to his. That's why he uses you. So don't let your failure keep you from flourishing. Talk to him about this. And then we'll move on. But we need to pause here and give you time to work with the Lord.